If you're here last week, Sunday morning, I preached on the love of God, and I, and I preached through John 3.16 and a lot of things like that. And, and I kind of wanted to go in a similar spirit tonight um, of preaching on just some positive aspects, some real positive things from the Bible. Um, and the title of my sermon tonight is The Peace of God Which Passeth All Understanding. And that, that, that verse alone and that phrase alone is just extremely, extremely powerful. To, to know that there is a peace, a peace that we can all have, an, an, an inner peace, a peace from God. So the peace of God it means it's coming from God, God's peace on us that passes all understanding. It's hard to even explain the peace that God provides for us and put it into words because that level of peace that God can provide for you passes all understanding. We live in a world today, I mean, just, just people in general, human beings, have a desire to want to be at peace, to want to have rest, to want to know, you know, we have, we have so many problems and so many things you have to deal with on a regular basis, so many stress factors, so many things that are going to make you just kind of feel like you're about to explode. And in general, by and large, people are seeking for something, and, and a lot of people are just seeking for peace. And that's why you'll see you know, so many various religions of the world will try to satisfy that quest for people to have peace peace at home. And oftentimes that's the number one thing that is driving people to religion, to any religion is just they want to have peace. You think about, you know, in Hinduism, they have their yoga techniques and their meditation techniques. And what's the point of that? They're trying to find inner peace. They're trying to find a peace for themselves. Buddhism, the same thing. A lot of the Eastern religions, they focus on having this meditation and this peace and this calm within them. Even Scientology is something that, that they want to attain the going clear is what they call it. I mean, it, it's a totally false, I mean, they're all false religions, but Scientology was one that's just completely made up by a science fiction writer, literally just to deceive people and to make money. Like that's all it was. For, it's, I can't even believe people have ever subscribed to it, but he won the bet that he made about being able to make a, a religion and he's got all kinds of people sucked into it. But, but even they will say, you know, the, the, the point is they're trying to help people find peace. Why? Because it's a basic human desire to want to find peace. And I, that's innate. That's within us. And that's because God wants us to know his peace. So when you realize there's something wrong inside and you need to find peace, that should help lead you to the truth. Unfortunately, there's people out there that are trying to give you false versions of, of receiving peace, and you're never going to find it. You're never going to find it down the false, the false religion avenue because it's all lacking. No matter what methods they have, no matter how much meditation you do, no matter how much you try to remove yourself or distance yourself from society and try to clear your mind, you're never going to have the peace which passes all understanding which is what people truly are desiring to have. But you see, Jesus Christ offers that peace for us. Let's read this passage here, verse number 6 of Philippians chapter 4. The Bible reads, Be careful for nothing. Be careful for nothing. We don't have to worry. What having care and being worried and, and being careful about this and being careful about that. He says, Be careful for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. So verse 6 that we're starting off reading here is, is basically just saying, you don't have to fret and you don't have to worry. Whatever it is that you need, hey, by prayer, supplication, make your requests made known to God and with thanksgiving. Don't go complaining to God. Don't go having a bad attitude to God. Be thankful for what you have. But if you're thankful with what you have, you go to God. He will supply your needs. He will provide the peace. You don't have to worry. You don't have to be careful. Because God is there to provide for you. Go to him with thanksgiving. Go to him in prayer and supplication. It says in verse 7, And the peace of God which passeth all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds 
through Christ Jesus. This peace applies not only to your heart, but also to your mind. You don't have to be worried, stressing out, because you have the peace of God as well as just feeling in your heart, having that peace. Verse 8, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. This is how we ought to have our mind occupied is with good things. This, this, you know, we shouldn't be, be filling our mind with the filth of this world and all the sin and debauchery and, and, and wickedness that's out in this world. Say, Think about good things. Keep your mind occupied thinking about things that are just, justice, good things to do, something that's pure, things that are lovely, things that are of good report. That's what we need to be thinking on. And then verse 9, those things which ye have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do. And the God of peace shall be with you. The God of peace. We see that there's so many references to the God of peace and God just wanting to give us his peace. We're going to go through. I have a lot of references here in my notes, but not nearly all of them. I mean, there's so many, it's just completely redundant how many times the Bible refers to God as being the God of peace, the God that wants to offer that peace. Uh, Colossians 3, turn if you would to Ephesians chapter 2. I'll just read this for you. In Colossians 3, Colossians 3, 14 says, and above all, the, and above all these things put on charity which is the bond of perfectness, and let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. And notice in Colossians 3, there's also that tie-in of being thankful. Having peace in your heart is related to being thankful for where you're at, because when you're not thankful, but rather you're bitter, or you're complaining, and you're, you're, you know, not satisfied with what you have, you're never going to have peace. That's why people who are covetous, you never have enough, no matter what you're covetous after. If you're coveting after money, you'll never have enough money to satisfy you. And you'll never have peace because you're just focused on having more and more and more and more and more money. If you're covetous after a person, someone you can't have, an adulterous affair or whatever, it's never going to be enough. It's never going to satisfy. It's never going to fill you up. You don't have peace that way. There's so many areas when you're just concerned about what you're lacking and maybe complaining and then starting to have a, a, a covetous type of a heart, desiring to have other stuff. You'll never have peace that way. But the Bible says, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Be satisfied with what God provides for you. That'll help you to have peace peace in your hearts. Ephesians chapter 2, look at verse number 13. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity. Even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now, well, I'm going to go through this whole passage again. There's a lot being said here. I just want to make sure I expound upon this enough for you to get a clear understanding of what this is talking about. And also, I'm just going to bring up in the sermon tonight, there's two types of peace that I'm going to be talking about. One is the peace that you receive by being saved through the blood of Jesus Christ. That is the primary peace. That is the peace which passeth all understanding. That is the peace that is eternal. That peace lasts forever. Nothing can take that away. And the fact that it's eternal in itself helps to provide peace to your heart because you don't have to worry about that being stripped away from you or taken away from you or lost because 
you didn't live up right enough, you didn't do enough good works. You don't have to worry about that. You can have peace in your heart just knowing that what Christ did on the cross is enough once for all to cover every single one of your sins. Every single sin that you've ever done in the past and will ever do in the future has all been bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ, which he shed on the, shed on the cross for you. Amen. It's all covered. Since he paid for the sins of the future, he paid for the sins of tomorrow, he paid for the sins of next week, we don't have to fret and worry and say, yeah, I know, I put my faith in Christ, but... I mean, what happens if I, if, I, if I wake up on the wrong side of the bed tomorrow and I'm just in a really bad mood and I end up doing something really bad and then you know, a chain of events happen and I just get into all kinds of sin? Does that mean I'm, you know, I might not be saved or I might go to hell? No. No, we don't have to fret and worry about those events because what Jesus did is enough. Once you've accepted that gift, hey, you're saved forever. Thank God. Praise the Lord for that peace. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. That provides peace, eternal life. There's something very calming and peaceful about that. Knowing that whenever our life ends here, we have an eternity, we have an existence of life with the Lord. That's some good news. That is the peace which passeth all understanding. Now, there's another piece that I'm going to get into in a little bit. First, we're going to focus more on the, just the peace that comes through Christ and what he did for us. That is the primary piece. But there's another piece, a temporary piece that you need to have or that you probably want to have in this life. And obviously, we, we are involved in different situations that you may not always feel the peace, even though you know you have ultimate eternal peace. You might not be feeling having that peace in the moment as your life continues. So we're going to talk about having both and, and how you can maintain that peace. Because if you live a wicked lifestyle, you won't have peace. Even if you have the eternal peace of your, of your soul being bought and paid for, you will always have that. You can never lose that. But when you find yourself just going off into sin, you won't have peace in this life. You won't even have that inner peace. It's not going to be the same. As, uh, as David said, he said in the Psalms, you know, Lord, uh, restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. When you're saved, there's a joy. You're happy. You, 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 you should have excitement and, and, and joy knowing that your soul is saved. But when you're living a wicked life and you're getting into matter, all, all manner of sin, you're, you're not, you don't have that joy because you're not walking in the Spirit. But I'm going to get into all that. That's kind of the, the second half of my sermon tonight. We're in Ephesians chapter 2. So Ephesians chapter 2, this, uh, we read verses 13 through 18. This is talking to the church at Ephesus. It's a Gentile church. okay? And he's, he's talking to this church. He's saying, you who sometimes were far off, you know, they're, they're estranged from God. They've been made nigh, they've been brought close to God through the blood of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ paid, paid for sin, all, all mankind's sin. Not just Israel, not just the Jews, everybody, all mankind, all men everywhere. So while yes, they were living in maybe in a wicked nation or a heathen nation, they didn't know God, they had idols or whatever, they heard about Jesus Christ. They believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and because of that, they were, made, they were made nigh unto God. He says, For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. There's no more difference now. There is no longer Jew nor Gentile in Christ. There is no more bond nor free. It's all one. He's saying there's no more distinction, because in Christ, we're all children of God. And he says here in verse number 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances for to make in himself of twain, which is two, one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. So he was able to reconcile. We needed to be reconciled to God. We'll be brought back in good standing with God as sinners. 
as people who have sinned against God, we need to be reconciled to God. And the blood of Christ accomplishes that. So when, you know, as a sinner, hey, you, you're not in good standing with the Lord. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death. We deserve a punishment. But because the blood of Christ came, we can be reconciled back into good standing with God. He says, having slain the enmity thereby and came and preached peace to you which were afar off and to them that were nigh. He's saying we preach peace both to the Jew and the Gentile. The ones that were close were the Jews. And the ones that were far off are the Gentiles, like the church of Ephesus. Saying you guys were far off, these guys were close, but hey, they both needed to be brought into the faith of the blood of Jesus Christ. And then both can be reconciled unto God. And he says, we preach peace to you. And that's what we should be preaching too. We're preaching the good news. The gospel is the good news. It's a good message. We go out and preach peace to people. And there's a lot of people seeking for that peace. And this is, this is something that might be a good, uh, you know, something good to, to, to bring up to people, especially people who you seem to have that, that they can, it's, it's sort of obvious that they're living a life full of turmoil and, and, and just nothing is probably going right for them. Just to mention the God of peace and the peace which passeth all understanding is available to them by, by receiving the love of the truth. It's something that, that is going to appeal to people and I think they're going to want to hear Jesus Christ said in the book of John, turn if you would to Romans chapter 3. I'm going to read for you from John 14 and John 16. John 14, 27 says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So Jesus came and he, and he said, I'm leaving you with peace. And then John 16, 33 says, These things have I spoken unto you that in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. So what he's saying, that the, the comforting words that he's giving here is that no matter what tribulation and trials and problems that you have in the world, he's saying you can still be of good cheer. You can still have a good attitude. You can still be joyful and happy and have peace even in the midst of tribulation. Why? Because your faith is in Christ and Christ has already overcome the world. No matter what the world can throw at you, no matter what problems you have from this world, Christ has already overcome the world. So we could remember what he's done for us and rest and have peace. Knowing that anything that comes our way, hey, my faith, my faith is in the one who's already overcome the world. That's some more good news. That's great news. That provides hope. You know, Christianity is not some dead religion. We're not the religion that, that worships statues and worships idols and, and worships in just made up, invented gods, but the one true, real, living God. The God that's able to provide peace, the God that's able to pay for all of our sins, to be able to wash us away, wash away our sins. You know, I know that peace comes from it. It comes from a peace of mind knowing that, you know, you could think about, man, I did this sin and this sin and this sin and this sin. And you know what? That ought to weigh on your mind and your conscience. You ought to be sorry about that. You ought to be upset by that, that you've allowed yourself to commit such sins. But the peace that God offers is saying all of that is just washed away. Completely washed away. Man, how good does a shower feel? I don't know how many of you guys are into camping or anything like that. You go on like, like camping trips, excursions. You go out, you're out for a week or a couple weeks. I go on hunting trips, you know, and you go and, and I'd, I'd, you know, I used to hunt for elk. You get an elk and you get bloody and you get dirty and you, you know, and, and, and then you're still just out camping. You know, you don't have these showers. And then you finally come home, you're done, you're exhausted, but you're filthy, right? But man, you get in that shower, that just feels so good. 
and you see all that nasty stuff just, just coming off your body and you step out pristine, man, that feels so good. How much better knowing the filth of your sin and all that you've done and that baggage that you might be carrying with you as a result of your sin can all just be washed away. Completely washed away. Because when God says it's gone, it's gone. As far as the east is from the west, which you know what? They never meet. They are eternally going opposite directions. As far as the east is from the west, so far they separated us from our sin. That is an eternal cleansing, a washing. What peace that provides. To never have to worry about the eternal judgment for what we've done, what we're guilty of because Christ took it for us. What an awesome piece. Romans chapter 3, we're going to contrast this with those that don't know peace, with the unsaved, with the unbelievers of the world. Romans chapter 3, verse number 10, the Bible reads, As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. Nobody's without sin in this world. We're, we all come fall short. We all come short of the glory of God. There's none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. That leaves you with a problem. That leaves you with not having peace because nobody's good. Nobody's perfect. We've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. He continues here in verse 13, though. Their throat is an open sepulcher. A sepulcher is a, is a tomb or a grave. You think about an open sepulcher, that doesn't smell too good. It's not going to look too good. Right? It's full of dead men's bones that have been rotting. And he says that's what their throat's like. Throat's an open sepulcher. With their tongues, they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. This is talking about wicked people, right? I mean, is there anything otherwise that you're getting from this passage? It's talking about people doing wickedness. Their mouth is full of cursing. They're full of bitterness. Does it sound like they're thankful? No, they're bitter. They're upset. They're angry. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in her ways. That's the, the wicked life is, is always going to bring misery. You don't have peace when you're miserable. And it says in verse 17, and the way of peace have they not known. They, don't, they, they haven't known the way to peace. There is no fear of God before their eyes. But see, we do know the way to peace. It's through Jesus Christ. There's only one way to peace. Romans 5, you want to flip over to Romans chapter 5, you're Romans 3. Romans 5, verse number 1, the Bible reads, Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. The only way we have this peace is because we're justified by faith. It's the only way. It's the only way to get it. Unfortunately, there's a lot of people out there that don't know. They don't know the way of peace. So it's our job to show them the way of peace. It's easy. The best part is, and the best news, is that you don't have to work for it. The work's already been done. Talk about having peace of mind. I've talked to many people who have told me, you know, I asked them if they wanted to be saved, like, hey, do you know for sure? Go, no, I'd probably go to hell. I'll say, well, hey, do you, do you want to know how to be saved? And oftentimes they'll just be like, yeah, I don't think I'm ready for that. I just don't think I can do it because they already have it in their mind that it involves some extra work and they already feel just, just beaten down and just they're a slave to their sin and they're like, I don't think I can overcome these sins because they have a false concept because they don't even know the way of peace. They think the way of peace has to do with just getting all of the sin out of their life, which while that will offer one level of peace, it's not the peace which passeth all understanding. 
We understand that peace. We know that the way of the wicked is hard. The Bible says there is no peace, saith the Lord, unto the wicked. We, we know that. That's common. You don't need religion. No, that's just experiential knowledge that when you do things that are wrong, you, all, you inherently don't have peace. But the peace that comes through salvation of God, that has nothing to do with your good works. Nothing at all. We need to show people that path, that way, the way of Jesus Christ, the way, the truth, and the life. Now flip over to Romans chapter 8. We're going to transition a little bit now because I was focusing a little bit more on, on just the, the peace of salvation. The eternal peace. The best peace. The peace. Now to the more temporal peace that we're going to receive in this life. That still is going to come through faith, but it's not the, it's not the saving faith. It's just trusting in God, trusting in His Word to do what's right. So even as a believer, you might feel sometimes like you're not at peace. First thing is, remember, being a child of God, ultimately you have, you, you, have, you have a big weight off your shoulders. And that's one of the things I love here when, I, when we go out soul winning and you talk to someone and they, and they finally understand salvation and this whole time they've been thinking they have to live right, they have to do right, and they, and they feel like, I, I've had so many people say this, wow, I just feels like a whole weight is just lifted off my shoulders. Other people have the same experience? If someone's told you that out soul winning, amen. Yeah. Why? Because when you feel like you just have to live a certain way, that is a big stress. That's a huge weight to carry around with you. Man, I mean, you just can't, you can't, you know what, it's such a heavy weight, you can't do it. You just can't do it. You fall under the weight. Impossible. And as soon as you realize, wait, you mean, <laughs> you mean it's possible for me to be saved? And even when I screw up and even when I sin and even when I don't do right, I'm still saved? Wow. Wow, that's incredible. He paid for all of that? And he's not requiring me to, to do this, 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 go to church every week, read my Bible every day, pray every day, do it, you know. No. Free gift. Amen. What a weight. What peace. But now let's get into the peace of that might be even more applicable to you as a believer where you're going, you know what? I don't feel like I have very much peace in my life. You know, I know I'm saved. I definitely have the peace of, of that salvation. And amen for that. But something still just doesn't seem right. I don't feel like I'm having the, the, the peace that I ought to be having in my life. Romans chapter 8, look at verse number 5. The Bible reads, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is enmity against God for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If so be that the spirit of God dwell in you. Now if any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his, and if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. So, the Bible says to be carnally minded is death. And obviously, when you get saved, you still have the carnal things. You have the carnal mind. You have, you have and carnal just means like of your body, right? It's, it's your flesh. You still have your mind, you still have the old desires, everything that you wanted to do that was wicked, that was sinful before you got saved is still with you after you get saved. It's still there. None of that changes. But what's new is the new creature, the new man, as the Bible calls it, um, that, that has been uh, that new birth that's born inside of you, the spirit. And the spirit, according to 1 John chapter 3, does not sin. It cannot sin. So you've got a battle between the flesh, which only can sin. The flesh cannot please God. The flesh cannot do that which is right. Versus the spirit, 
which only does good and only does right, and you're kind of stuck in the middle, right? Your, your consciousness, who you are, your soul is, is kind of in the middle there going, well, can I, should I be walking in the spirit or should I be walking in the flesh? Because they're both present with you. So it's a constant battle. Now, we know that if you decide to walk in the flesh, you're going to be fulfilling the lusts of the flesh and turn to Galatians chapter number five. Galatians chapter five. Galatians five tells us what the works of the flesh are. So if you choose, because, hey, God gave us free will. You're not some, some robot that's just going to do whatever it is that God told you to do. God lets you choose. He's given you the consciousness to, to decide and the will to be able to say, this is what I'm going to do or this is what I'm going to do. Right? Wrong? The choice is completely left up to you. And because as a born-again believer, we still have this flesh, the choice is up to you every single day, every single moment of every day, you can choose. Am I going to walk in the flesh or am I going to walk in the spirit? Here's the, the, the results of the flesh. Here, here's what it means to walk in the flesh. If we look at verse number 19. The Bible says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. So these are the works. Of, if you decide to walk in the flesh, here's what you're going to get. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Basically, without just going on and on and on and on, you get the idea. Now, do all these things just sound like a really happy life that's just going to make you have a joyful life? Hey, I'm living in adultery as a drunk. Yeah, because so many people that live that way just have the best life in the world, right? They just have this best love as they're cheating on their spouse and they're having so much fun waking up with those hangovers and vomiting on their hands and knees in some filthy toilet somewhere. Yeah, there's a lot of peace in that, right? No, of course not. But this is what you get when you choose to walk in the flesh. Well, that doesn't sound like a good option. It doesn't sound very peaceful. So what happens if we choose to walk in the Spirit? Look at verse number 22. But the fruit of the Spirit, so this is what happens. This is the result, the fruit that comes forth of walking in the Spirit. When you choose to walk in the Spirit, the new man is inside of you and choose to walk that way. Here is what results from that. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, Peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Boy, that sounds a lot better. That sounds like the way I want to live my life. That sounds like, like the path I want to take. This is how you're going to have that peace as a believer and to understand and to really feel and comprehend that peace that goes, that's not, again, not just a piece of your salvation, which is an amazing peace in, it, uh, in and of itself, but if you want to maintain peace just in your life, you need to choose to walk in the Spirit. Notice how, the, how everything, all of this good stuff, notice how these are just the fruit, like this is all stuff that comes from the Spirit versus the works of the flesh. There's the fruit of the Spirit, which is what comes out, versus the works of the flesh. The works of the flesh, we need to avoid the works of the flesh to keep you in, because if you're, if you're doing these things that are listed on the works of the flesh, you're in the flesh. Because you will not, you cannot do those things if you're walking in the Spirit. It's one or the other. You can't be walking in both simultaneously. You're either doing the works of the flesh or you're going to re reap the fruit of the Spirit by walking in the Spirit. 
The Bible says, uh, turn if you go to James chapter 3. We're almost done. James chapter 3. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 11, Finally, brethren, farewell. Be perfect. Be of good comfort. Be of one mind. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace shall be with you. As I mentioned before, you know, this is, this is something that's spoken of many, many times throughout the Bible. It's unfortunate to not hear enough of this, but we need to hear it again in the right, um, the right view, the right light. What just came into my mind is, you know, and I think this may be one reason why some Baptist churches ha don't preach on peace. And I don't know, you know, I, I don't spend my time listening to what everyone else is, is preaching or doing. I'm more worried about just preaching what's right in, in the scripture. But I can see where people might just kind of avoid the whole peace subject in general with what happened with the hippie movement. You know, going, peace, man, peace. You know, you got these, these, these guys that are into their sex, drugs, and rock and roll and, and, you know, talking about peace. Peace is a good thing. It is a good thing. We don't want to be at war. We don't want to be at enmity. We don't want to be in these fighting and strives. You want to live in peace. It's, it is a good thing. That's one thing that, that is a good, that's a virtuous thing to want peace. But see, their version of peace, they don't, it, doesn't, it doesn't bring peace. Like Their lifestyle doesn't bring peace. You're never going to have peace living the life. that they were, So it's this, this, this false version of peace. And, you know, people might not want to be, I don't want to be associated with, with that, with their view, but peace in itself is a good thing. So we're not like the, the peace dude, you know, that's, that's not uh, exactly what we're saying here. However, um, the peace of God, you're going to find it through loving God and loving his commandments and doing what's right. The, the peace that was promoted of the 60s is basically fulfilling the lust of your flesh. Whatever feels good, just go ahead and do it. The free love, the fornication, the adultery, the, the drunkenness, the drugs. But that doesn't bring peace. It doesn't. You're never going to find peace with that stuff. It's a, it's a really cheap, poor substitute for, for the void that you're trying to fill and it'll never be filled. The Spirit can fill that. You're in James chapter 3. Look at verse number 18. The Bible says, And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. We ought to try to make peace. The Bible says in, in Matthew chapter 5 in the Beatitudes that blessed are the peacemakers, for they are the children of God. People who, who make peace. Um, and that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to bring people the peace of God. Now, one good way to understand peace in this world is compare that to what's the opposite of peace? War. Well, James chapter 4 talks about where war comes from. James chapter 4, verse number 1 says, from whence come war. So it's saying, where does it come from? Where do wars even come from? From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts, that war in your members. He's saying this is where all the wars and the fighting and the striving all comes from. The reason why you don't have peace is because you're walking in your flesh, because you're allowing the lusts that are in your members, meaning in your flesh, to war and to fight in the battle. He says, ye lust, in verse 2, ye lust and have not. Ye kill, look at this, and desire to have. There's that covetous attitude, not being thankful. We covered it at the beginning of the sermon. You desire to have and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you have not, because you ask not. You ask and receive not, because you ask amiss, that you may consume it upon your lusts. See, when you have something that you really need, something that is a necessity for you, all you have to do is ask for that and God will give it to you. Now, if you're asking for things that you don't need, that's literally just for you to, to, to fulfill your own lust, well, that's not good for you anyways, and God's not going to give that to you. So if God's not giving you something that you're asking for, it's for your own benefit. Don't be bitter about not receiving that. 
because God doesn't want you to fulfill the lusts of your flesh. He wants you to have the fruit of the Spirit and to have the joy and the peace and the, and the long-suffering and gentleness and goodness and faith and all that. Let's keep reading here. Verse number four. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God? Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Another powerful verse here, but, but let that sink in. Being a friend of the world all that the world has to offer, all that the world's putting out. If you're just just buddy buddy friends with the world, I'm all good with what the world's putting out there. All good with the messaging of the world. All good with everything that this world has to offer and put out. I get along with that. I'm for that. What does this world have to put out? All unity between everybody, right? And this is the false piece of saying, hey, all religions should just band together and just say, well, basically, you know, whatever, whatever you believe, whatever I believe, it doesn't matter. We're all just praying to our God. And if that does good for you and if that helps you out, then that's a good thing. That's what the world puts out. The Bible says that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. You say, how could that be a bad thing? I thought we were supposed to have peace. Doesn't that bring peace? No. It's a false peace. Why? Because it's going to send people to hell. That's why. To be tolerant and accepting. It's one thing just to allow people to believe what they believe. I'm not against that. I think people should have the choice to believe what they want to believe. I'm not just saying you, you, you're mandated to, to have a certain belief. Because that doesn't produce a real belief anyways. People need to have genuine beliefs. But I'm not going to compromise what God's Word says and what the Bible says just to get along with people either. We want to live at peace. We want to have this peace. I would like for everybody to accept the truth of just being God's Word. This is the truth. This is right. We could all be at peace if everyone could agree on that. Not everyone's going to. That's why there's still a fight. There's still a spiritual war going on. But we want to have peace. We strive to have peace. But we're not going to have peace, and the world's not going to have peace as long as people want to fulfill the lust of their flesh. That's just a fact. And the Bible says here, if you want to be a friend of the world, you're at enmity with God. It means you're God's enemy. Now, think about that. Do you think you're really going to find peace being God's enemy? Say, Hi, I'm the enemy of God. But, I, but I'm going to live a peaceful life. No way. You can't, you can't have that. And, and you know, I'm not going to go in depth on, on how you can apply this, but, but just meditate on this later on tonight and think about this verse, just being a friend of the world. Because that's an important verse. Think, about, think for yourself, what does that mean to be a friend of the world? And it's important because... When you understand what a friend of the world is and you understand that it makes you an enemy of God, that ought to sink down and make you really question what you believe and what you think. Am, am I an enemy of God? Am I being a friend of this world? What does that mean to be a friend of this world? Because you don't want to be a friend of the world, obviously. Let's keep reading here. We're almost done. Uh, verse number five. Do you think that the scripture saith in vain, the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace. Wherefore, he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. The last, ver last passage I'm going to read for tonight, we're going to look at, is in Romans 12. Romans 12, 17. The Bible says, Recompense no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. We are called to live peaceably. You know, I, I preach about mostly the inner peace that you could have. The peace from having salvation through the blood of Jesus Christ, having all of your sins washed away. Great peace to have. There's a peace that you can have just by walking in the Spirit and reaping the fruit of the Spirit, which is peace, and doing that which is right. You're able, you know, when you do right, you're able to lay your head down on your pillow and have no worries, have no concerns, have no fears when you know that you've done right. What a good feeling that is to put in a full day's work, to put your head down on your pillow and know that, man, I'm doing essentially what God wants me to do. I don't have grievous sins in my life. I'm, you know, 
That's just a, that's peaceful. And that's not being proud or boastful. Oh, you think you're perfect? No, I don't think I'm perfect. I know I'm still a sinner. But when you're not just living this life of just total wickedness, you do receive peace. When you walk in the Spirit, you do have peace. And when you know you've been walking in the Spirit, you, you do know you've been walking in the Spirit because you have that peace. But finally, the, this verse teaches us that we are called to live peaceably as, as much as is possible. Is it always possible? No. No, because there's wicked people that are ultimately going to withstand and try to shut you down for preaching the truth, for preaching the word of God. They killed Jesus. They crucified him. How much more uh, shall they do unto them of his own household? They're going to call you names. They're going to try to stop what you're, what you're doing. You're going to face opposition, not because you want to face opposition, because the opposition is going to come and find you. The fight's going to come to you. We're not going out trying to start wars and wage wars. I am for peace. But when I speak, they are for war. That's what the Bible says. We're, we're, we want to be at peace. We're trying to bring peace to people, yet there are those that hate the message, they hate God, they hate you know, the author of the message, and they want to fight against it. So when the fight comes to us, we don't just back down. We stand up. We want peace, but we're not pacifists. We want peace, but we'll stand up and fight and be a good soldier for Jesus Christ. We will stand in the battle, no matter how hot the battle gets. But our ultimate goal and desire is peace. And you know what? There is coming a day of peace. When, when the swords are going to be beaten into plowshares and, and um, you know, all the weapons of war are going to be turned into other tools because God's going to bring a peace. It's not going to come through the Antichrist. The Antichrist is going to promise peace. That's what's coming. Be aware of that. The Antichrist is going to come and try to bring this message of world peace. And that, that message of world peace is going to come at the price, at the, at the cost of the lives of, of believers. But he, that's, that's the message he's going to bring. But he's trying to impersonate Jesus Christ. Because when Jesus Christ comes, he is going to bring peace. He's going to rule and reign and, and let us understand, wow, this is the way things ought to have been run this whole time. And oh, the peace and the joy that we'll have during that time. Amen. Something good to, to look forward to. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the peace that you, you provide to us. I pray that you would please just uh, help us to be able to preach this message of peace to others. And Lord, help us in our lives to, to walk in the Spirit and to not fulfill the lusts of our flesh, that, that we could understand and walk in peace and in the love of God. Lord, we thank you for providing that to us. I thank you that, that you haven't left us comfortless and that you, uh, you've given us such great hope. Lord, help us to share the reason for that hope with others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.